power that we have, prayerfully we're going to use it to benefit others and not take advantage of others. One of the quickest ways to stop people to reach a common goal is to have that good old form of disunity. And we saw in chapter 4 that the adversary that came to stop them from doing the work came from the outside. Now we're going to see the adversary is going to be a little different because the hardest time uh, that we have is when the adversary is from within the city within the the ranks of those that are present. And here's that part that we need to note. Satan doesn't need to raise up enemies against God's work if he can turn God's people against each other. Uh, a few years ago, there was a study done <laughs> using the monopoly and the thing was, the two players, one of the players was given two dice and a wad of money. The other player must have been black. Oh, no, I'm sorry. The other player was uh, received only one of the dice, and knowing how things usually work, he probably didn't have all the dots colored in, and he didn't have half the money. Well, within a few minutes of the game, uh, the guy that had all the advantage um, he he wasn't thinking about half of the stuff that he needed to do. Because every time he turned around, the other guy was landing on his property. So he wouldn't have him to think too hard. So it didn't take long before uh, they realized that there was a little problem. And that problem sometimes gets to be when we uh, uh, have issues with each other especially issues with status and power. So, uh, okay, here's my first question for everybody. How has the little bit of power that you have affected you? Well, Let's, let's first acknowledge one thing. All of us have some power, right? Now, we all do. We, we all do. Um, so, how has that little bit of power affected you? Okay, gave you some courage to do some other things. Gave you some other things to do. Okay. That is? Okay, you're not thinking about the power that you have because uh, you have power. There you go. You have power over your grandkids. You got power over your kids. You got power over your over your household. There you go. Okay. So how does that power work? How does it affect you? Mm -hmm. 
and they know they have to go by my rules. That's the whole thing, because you have to realize uh, there are rules to be followed. There are there are a lot of things that you, you need to take care of. So, God gave us all a certain amount of influence and power, but are we using that power appropriately? Are we using it to influence others in the way that God wants us to? It is not wrong to have influence or power. We don't have to feel guilty when we have a little money. Uh, but we do need to ask this question. What is it that God would have me to do with the power and the wealth that he's given me? And as a result, uh, is this going to end up being a social issue or a gospel issue? Well, let's first off define what a social issue is. Anybody? Yeah, what is a social issue? Okay. Communication. What about some others? Sometimes they not know that my power. No, he don't think I have my power. And sometimes I have to act a fool to get him to spread the power to play. Okay. Oh. Well, that, that's usually how that works. Okay. Here, here's a list of social issues that we presently have. Poverty. Violence. Social justice or the lack thereof, <laughs> health care, immigration, climate change, economic in inequity or inequality, here's a good one, discrimination, still got discrimination going on today, uh, unemployment, Racism. Here's another hot button topic abortion. Politics. Crime. Rights. Uh, houselessness. Not homelessness, houselessness. <laughs> Gun control, gender inequality, domestic violence, sexism, ageism, terrorism, bullying, then we got the civil and political rights, and here's the biggie of them all. Mental disorder. So now, here's the question. How many how many of those existed back in the days of Nehemiah? I'm a great majority of them. Okay? In chapter 4, 
Nehemiah faced some stiff opposition to the wall, but it was on the outside. In chapter 6, he'll have to deal with that same opposition again. But here in chapter 5, he faces a threat, but the face is, the the threat is internal. The strife was within the uh, the ranks of his people. Uh, here they were trying to build up the nation. Here they were trying to build up the wall and trying to get everybody together, and who's fighting against them? Their own people. It's like a family dispute. So, if this was allowed to happen, the promises of God would never come through the Jewish people and the world would never have had Bible nor the promised seed, the Messiah of the world. The world would have been both without the word of God and the Savior of the world. But in Nehemiah chapter 5, we see that the Jewish families were paying a great price for rebuilding the wall. Financially, things were difficult. It was so difficult that they were having to sell their kids. Now, I know there have been a couple of times you probably wouldn't have minded selling the, that one or that one, depending on which child was acting the fool or what day it was. And kill her kids. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here's the whole thing before we end up going down a rabbit hill. Uh, it is one thing when you are having to sell your kids to pay your bills uh, and you're not selling them because or right you're not selling them for habits right you're having to sell your children or put them uh you're having to do this to make ends meet now uh we're gonna see that i i don't know if you can imagine part of your yard, you, you having to sell part of your yard just to make ends meet. I mean, just think about your yard. To make ends meet. Things are a little rough. And who's taking advantage of these people? Their own people. Those with power in Jerusalem were exploiting their neighbors. They were abusing the poor, manipulating the situation to benefit uh, everything, but it was in direct violation to God's law. Uh, let's see, Leviticus chapter 25, starting at verse 35. If one of the brothers becomes indigent and cannot support himself, help him. The same as you would a foreigner or a guest so that he can continue to live in your neighborhood. Don't gouge him with interest charges out of reverence. Uh, out of reverence for your God, help your brother to continue to live with you in the neighborhood. Don't take advantage of his plight 
by running up big interest charges on his loans and don't give him food for profit. I am your God who brought you out of Egypt to give you the land of, of Canaan and to be your God. And if one of your brothers becomes indigent, and has to sell himself to you, don't make him work as a slave. Treat him as a hired hand or a guest among you. He will work for you until the Jubilee, after which he and his children are set free to go back to the clan and their ancestral land. Right. It says don't don't worry about it. Right. So now we have Exodus chapter 22, verse 25. says, if you lend money to my people, who is his people? The Israelites. If you lend money to my people, to any of the down and out among you, don't come down on hard on them and gouge them with interest. And then we have in Deuteronomy chapter 23, don't charge interest to your kinsmen uh, on any loan, not for food or money or clothing or anything else that would earn interest. You may charge foreigners' interest, but you may not charge your brother's interest. That way, God, your God, will bless you all the work uh, that you have to take up in the land that you are entering to possess. So now, here's that whole issue. Here, here's that question. Are people still being exploited? Yeah, without a doubt. Who is doing the exploiting now? Politicians. <laughs> the rich. Anybody with power is doing that exploiting. Here's the problem. God is more concerned when he's within the ranks of the family than he is the foreigners because what is he going to do? He's going to deal with everybody. Okay? He's going to clean house. Nehemiah chapter 5, starting in verse 1. A great protest had mounted by the people, including the wives, against their fellow Jews. Some said, we have big families, and we need food just to survive. Others said, we're having to mortgage our fields and vineyards and homes to get enough grain to keep from starving. And others said, we're having to borrow money to pay the royal tax on our fields and vineyards. Look, we're the same flesh and blood as our brothers here. Our children are as good as, as theirs. Yet, here we are having to sell our children off as slaves. Some of our daughters are already been sold, and we can't do anything about it because our fields and vineyards are owned by somebody else. So, When we were talking about the social issues, mm -hmm. we got injustice, we got poverty, we got crime, we got economic oppression, we got inequality, we got anger, and we got one letter short of that anger becoming danger. And there are people that are going through terrible changes. Uh, so the first thing that we see with these issues is the complaint. 
the groups that are being oppressed by the famine, the poor who have enough food to survive, that we got big families and we just need to, we need food to survive. Now here's my question. Did anybody tell them to keep multiplying? <laughs> That's what God told them to do. In fact, it was, if you remember back when they were in Egypt, the harder that they were worked, the more children that they had. Okay? Uh, live your life. The property owners who had mortgaged their fields and homes in order to buy food. Can you imagine having to sell part of your house just so you could eat? And then we also do it with plastic. Okay? Others who had to borrow money to pay their taxes to the Persian government. So there's the complaint, then there's the outcry. The outcry is, notice it says there is a great outcry. How many of you have visited the hospital recently? Well, and sometimes you go to the nursing home. It is the same with the nursing home or a hospital. Those that are suffering the most are crying out. Now, here's the downside. If you worked in medicine for an extended period of time, that crying goes on deaf ears because it becomes a repetitive action. There was a lady that was across the hall from me. She was crying out. I'm thinking she's in pain. She's crying out because she's been left there at the hospital. No relatives have come to see her. But the time she was crying out was at night. <laughs> so, and part of that was because she was a little confused as to what time things were going on and that happened. So now, what are they crying for? They're crying for consideration. They're crying for compassion. Consider having to sell their sons and daughters to have corn or something to eat. Uh, how often do people that are hurting desperately want somebody to consider what they're going through? In fact, anytime a child gets hurt, set them there. Anytime a child gets hurt, uh when you're when you go to rub in whatever area it is has been hurt. Uh does that really soothe the hurt? No. The child seems to think so. Just putting on that band aid becomes something magical. Thanks, bro. So is it make it feel better? Uh, does anybody know anybody that's ever committed suicide? Okay. Those times that you've known that person, they've cried out, they've tried to get somebody to pay some attention to what they're going through, right? And as a result of not being paid attention to, what do they do? They come in and you feel guilty. 
you go from one extreme to the other. Okay? So, they're crying out for consideration. They're also crying out for compassion. Because when you're hurting, you're wanting somebody to know that they see you, and if they can help you, they will help you. Here's the whole thing. Uh, there are many times now we have a few more resources than we had in the past. So we can respond a little different now, more so by just doing one thing, listening and allowing them to talk because it's in allowing them to talk that we either discern that there is a actual issue, mental issue, or that something else needs to take place. Uh, it used to be that our only recourse was to call the police, and we know that ain't the right thing to do, because as a result, what's going to happen? They are going to handle it incorrectly. IT officer. Now, here's the problem when they decide not to still listen. That gets to be another issue. Well, let's take a look here at what God's Word says about hard and insensitive hearts. And we see that that's what's going on here. Uh, let's take a look right here at the uh, Proverbs 28 and 14 says a tender hearted person lives a blessed life. A hard hearted person lives a hard life. Then we see in Acts chapter 28 these people are blockheads. They stick their fingers in their ears so that they won't have to listen. They screw their eyes shut so they don't have to look, so that they don't have to deal with me. And he's talking, he's talking about uh, God face to face and let me heal them. So what happens during that time? They end up messing themselves up. Then Paul tells the church at Rome in Romans chapter 2, starting at verse 5, you're not getting by with anything. Every refusal and avoidance of God adds fuel to the fire. The day is coming when it's going to be a blaze hot and high. God's fiery and righteous judgment. So make no mistake. In the end, you'll get what's coming to you. Real life for those who work on God's side, but to those who insist on getting their own way and take the path of least resistance, fire. If you go up against the grain, you'll get splintered, regardless of which neighborhood you're from, what your parents taught you, what schools you attend. So, a little rough there. 
Uh, what does God have to say about selfishness, greed, and covetousness? Well, take a look right off at the bat at the Ten Commandments. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, where he says, No lusting after your neighbor's house, or wife, or servant, or maid, or ox, or donkey. Don't let your heart, don't set your heart on anything that is your neighbor's. Uh, then we have Ecclesiastes chapter 5, uh, verse 10. The one who loves money is never satisfied with money. The one who what? Loves money. Not the one who loves the wealth with big profits or smoke. Then we have Luke chapter 12, where Jesus tells this wonderful story. Uh, he tells them to protect themselves against the least bit of greed said, life is not defined by what you have, even if you have a lot. And then he goes on to tell them this story. The farm of a certain rich man produced a terrific crop. He thought to himself, uh, what can I do? My barn isn't big enough for this harvest. Then he said to himself, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll gather in my grain and goods, uh, and I'll say to myself, Self, you've done well. You've got it made, and now you can retire. Take it easy and, and have the time of your life. And here's the line. Just then God showed up and said, Fool, tonight you die. And your barn full of goods, who gets it? That's what happens when you fill your barns with self and not God. Yes, sir. Then we have Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Don't be obsessed with getting more material things. Be relaxed with what you have since God assured us, I'll never leave you down. I'll never let you down. Never walk off and leave you. I don't know about you, but that has provided more comfort for me uh, than anything else. Then 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, lust for money brings trouble and nothing but trouble. Going down that path, some lose their footing in the path, in the faith completely and live to regret it bitterly ever after. So now, it, it's the so-called religious folk uh, the Jewish brothers that are taking advantage of their kinfolk. And as a result, sometimes that creates some additional problems because just as all of that took place back then, it's still happening today. How is it happening today? It's happening with redlining. Right. Yeah. is happening with the school-to-prison pipeline. What is the school-to-prison pipeline? Uh, when they get to the third grade, they can pretty much pick one jail. How many prisons do we need to build so that we can put them away? Yeah. Set up. We have the abortion rate issue. We have police brutality. So much of what we are dealing with today is tied to what was going on back then. The only difference is 
it's still hypocrisy. It's still oppression. Uh, and here's the part that I love is that Nehemiah dealt with the hypocrisy of his brethren early and didn't let it go too far. You know, sometimes we have that bad habit. Well, I'm here to tell on somebody's parent. Mm -hmm. There's nothing worse than not wanting to correct the child right at that moment and you build that punishment up. And so when you start punishing the child, you, uh, in one particular instance, and she's not on this call, uh, a certain mother said, hold her while I catch my breath so I can finish doing what I need to do. Now, here's that whole thing. Uh, Nehemiah heard the cry for justice, and he acted on it. And we see that starting in verse 6. He says, when I heard their, their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and the officials. I told them, you are charging your own people interest. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have brought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your own people, only for them to buy back, uh, buy, to sell them back to us. They kept quiet because they couldn't say anything. So I continued. What you're doing is not right. Did you work? Did you walk out in fear of the Lord to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers are men who are tending the people, uh, lending the people money, wow, and grain. But let us stop charging interest. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses, and also the interest you're charging them. One percent of the money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. And what did they say? We'll give it back. And we will not demand anything more from them. We will do what you say. Now, have we heard this before? And the people said, we're not going to misbehave anymore. And what did they keep doing? Oh, book, <laughs> book of Judges. That's right. Then I summoned the priest and made nobles and officials take the oath to do what they had promised. And I shook out the folds of my robe and said, in this way, may God shake out of their house and possession, anyone who does not keep this promise. So may such a person be shaken out and emptied. At this, the whole assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord, and the people did as they had promised. So, it, it's kind of interesting how there always has to be a great outrage in order for a response to be obtained. So the first thing we see is his anger. So that question got asked, uh, should we get angry? He says, be angry, but sin not. Okay. But along with that anger came some action. And the two legal charges brought against them were that they were, the nobles were, he called the nobles on the carpet and said, you're gouging your brothers. And then at the public meeting, he called 
He told them to give them their stuff back. Okay? Now, it's one thing when you know better. It's something else when you just keep on doing for the sake of doing. Nehemiah warned the wealthy of the land that they needed to fear God. He challenged them to be a witness for God. And then he gave his own personal testimony because we're going to see that he does some things that uh, he had to encourage some other people to do. But we see in Isaiah 55 and 7, he says, Let the wicked abandon their way of life and their evil way of thinking. Let them come back to God who is merciful. Come back to our God who is lavish with forgiveness. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for that forgiveness. <laughs> Thank you for giving from the old days to now in this community. I know it's helping with me, mm. it's really helping y'all. People knew everybody. When you did something, they would tell on you and get in trouble. I'm now right. on this day in front of the Holy Ghost Church. That right. In the summertime, every step, somebody went and told my grandma. And that was the first and last time I ever been to the front of everything. But now people don't even have no big neighbor. Right. That was one reason why I knew on 41st Street. When I'm Christmas time, I put next door and so I gave them a Christmas card to introduce myself. Right. And I heard about it, they be called Miss Ann. I have Miss Ann. But, but here, here's that me. whole thing about the neighbor thing. Yeah. Uh, in my neighborhood alone. Now, I'm back here. Now. I've had five new neighbors in less than two years. And here's that whole thing. It's been a situation that has gotten them uh, removed from that housing that has not been something that's been favorable. So, in trying to witness to them, sometimes they hear, sometimes they don't. And here's that part you just you just made a, a bold statement right there. Second Chronicles chapter seven verse fourteen says, "And if my people, my God defined people." Respond by humbling themselves, praying, seeking my presence, and turning their backs on their wicked lives. I'll be there, ready for you. I'll listen from heaven, forgive their sins, and restore their land to health. Then Jesus told them, unless you turn to God, you will die. So then we see, starting at verse 14, how Nehemiah shared his wealth with others, how he did all these things um, because he realized that there were some people that were hurting. And this is the part that I, I sort of pounded on the other day. In each of these situations that we're going to be talking about, you know a name that you can put there. You know the name of an orphan. You know the name of a widow. You know the name of a widower. You know the name of someone that is broken hearted. You know the name of somebody that is backslidden. You know the name of a prisoner. You know the name of a deceased, diseased person. Somebody injured, somebody handicapped, somebody hungry, thirsty, poverty stricken. 
you know somebody that is empty, lonely, depressed, hospitalized, shut in, or dying. You know that name, right? What are we to do about it? Well, God gives us a mighty word. Two words. One is compassion. The other is service. What do we do about the compassion part? Uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 1. Those who are strong and able in the faith need to step in and lend a hand to those who falter and not just do what is most convenient for us, but strength is for service, not status. Colossians 3 and 12. So, chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. And that wardrobe consists of compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, and discipline. Uh, what is quiet strength? Oh my God. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard somebody say, well, I had to go by and deal with this and I had to go by and I was like, you just trying to blow smoke. Oh yeah. Well, here's a passage that I felt was very appropriate here, and that's 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 3, where Paul says, All praise to the God and the Father of our Master, Jesus the Messiah, Father of all mercy, God of all healing counsel. He comes alongside us to get us through the hard times, and before you know it, he brings us alongside someone who's going through hard times so we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. How many times have you found that to be true? Lots of times. We have plenty of hard times that come from following the Messiah, but no more than the good times of his healing comfort. We can get a full measure of that too. He is the God of all comfort. That's good news, y'all. So, he first says we need to be compassionate, and then he gives us a word about service. And evidence of this is in Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse 42, where he says, give a cup of cool water to someone who is thirsty. The smallest act of giving and receiving makes you a true apprentice. You won't lose out on a thing. And on the, the upper room discord, in John chapter 13, he says, so, if I, the master and teacher, washed their feet, you must now wash each other's feet. What is he saying there? We need to be foot wash Baptists. We need to be serving one another. Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 13. He says, it is absolutely uh, clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to, to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. Then he continues in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. Therefore, any time that we get a chance, let us work for the benefit of all, 
starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. Then, I don't know if you remember from Sunday's sermon, James chapter 2, starting at verse 14. He says, Dear friends, do you think you'll get anywhere in if uh, in this if you learn all the right words but never do anything? Does merely talking about faith indicate that a person really has it? For instance, if you come upon an old friend dressed in rags and half starved and you say, Good morning, friend. Be clothed in Christ. Be filled with the Holy Spirit and walk off without providing so much as a coat or a cup of soup. Where does that get you? It is, isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? I can already hear one of you agreeing, saying, sounds good. You take care of the faith department and now handle the works department. Not so fast. You can no more show me your works apart from your faith than I can show you my faith apart from my works. Faith and works, works and faith, fit together, hand in glove. So, what do we need to do? We first need to, don't forget to remember where all your blessings come from. Please don't forget that. Secondly, we need to be a walking, talking, breathing, loving example of compassion just as Christ was. We need to realize that Christ models for us how social issues can be fixed using the gospel. There's not one of those issues that we talked about earlier that cannot be fixed using the gospel. Our giving helps to squash many of the social issues when we decide to give obediently. And last but not least, we need to pray to remain humble and not take advantage of those less fortunate than you. So, with that in mind, Pray that something's been said that made you think a little different. I pray that something has been said that will cause a move on your heart so that you can treat somebody a little different uh, and you can help them out in the process. Uh, I, I love each and every one of you and want to see you again next week. Most gracious and all wise God, we come before you, Lord, just saying thank you for this day. Lord, we bless you, praise you, and magnify you for all the ways that you have kept us and how you are guiding. We, we just love you for how you love us many times in spite of ourselves, how you have shown mercy to us in spite of ourselves how you've been gracious to us in spite of ourselves. Uh, Lord, there are many things that uh, we've fallen short on, but once again, you you just come through uh, and, and been a great blessing to each and every one of us. Lord, we have plenty of folk that are in need of a healing, yeah. asking you to move right now as only you can. Uh, we have folk that have the healing process has started. Uh, we're just asking that you, you continue to be with them. Don't let them get weak in well-doing. Uh, that in the process of that healing, Lord, sometimes it, it requires us to maintain our faith. Please be with each and every one. Lord, uh, you heard the prayer request of others. Requests for guidance, requests for comfort, requests for direction. Uh, Lord, also in there uh, is a request for deliverance. 
and uh, we, we know that you are our deliverer. And for that, Lord, we're just thankful. Now, Lord, as we celebrate uh, the milestones of our classmates today, uh, I thank you for the birthdays. I thank you for the things that have gone on well in their lives and ask you continue to be with them. These things we ask in your mighty and majestic son's name, amen. Brenda Sue.